Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Q1 FY24 earnings conference call of EPL Limited, hosted by Systematics Institutional Equities. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode. And there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star 10-0 on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Pratik Tholia from Systematics Institutional Equities. Thank you, and over to you, Mr. Tholia. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks, Michelle. Uh, good evening, everyone. On behalf of Systematics Institutional Equities, I would like to welcome all the participants who logged into the first quarter FY24 uh, earnings conference call of EPL. From the management team, uh, we have Mr. Anand Kripalu, MD and Global CEO, Mr. M. R. Ramaswamy, COO, Mr. Amit Jain, CFO, Mr. Srihari Rao, President, NISA Region. At the outset, I would like to thank the management for giving us the opportunity to host this conference call. I would like to now invite Mr. Anand Kripalu to begin the proceeding by taking us through the quarters that has gone by. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Pratik. And um, hello, everyone. Very good evening to you and welcome to the Q1 FY24 uh, earnings call. Before we get into the discussion on Q1 results, I am pleased to introduce EPL's new CFO, Deepak Goel, who is here with us today on the call. We are very excited to have Deepak on board, and I have no doubt that he will be a great addition to the team. He brings a wealth of rich experience of over 22 years across diverse industries like FMCG, financial services, and hospitality tech. He has a proven track record in Indian and global roles in established companies like PepsiCo, GE, and OYO. Most recently, Deepak was the CFO for OYO Vacation Homes, one of the largest vacation rental businesses in Europe and was based in Switzerland. So he has now relocated with his family to Mumbai. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank our outgoing CFO, Amit Jain, for his 11 years at EPL, particularly through the COVID crisis and the promoter stake sale. And Amit, of course, is also with us here today and will be uh, helping me to respond to some of your questions. So, moving on to our performance for Q1 FY24, the operating environment continued to steadily move in the right direction in the last quarter, with input costs stabilizing. EPL's Brazil operations have been steadily ramping up, but for better comparison, all financial numbers are excluding Brazil unless otherwise mentioned. In Q1, EPL posted a solid revenue growth of 9.2%, broad-based across all regions. MSR grew at 5%, partly impacted by the devaluation of the Egyptian pound. EAP continues to bounce back with double-digit growth of 11.5%. Europe grew by 7.8% and America grew by 9.5%. Our continued focus on personal care and beyond has seen success with the category now contributing 49% to total sales in Q1. Importantly, the journey on EBITDA margin recovery has persisted. We delivered a solid EBITDA margin of 17.9%, an improvement of 282 basis points, with an absolute EBITDA growth of 29.6% year-on-year. This is a result of softening costs coupled with active price management, mixed improvement, and productivity. Significantly, this is the fourth straight quarter of EBITDA margin increase, signaling the recovery in the business. Net profit for the company grew by 82.3%. ROC also improved 
to 16.2%. Including Brazil, the EBITDA margin stood at 17.5%, and absolute EBITDA and packed growth rates were 26.6% and 57.4% respectively. By way of an update on Brazil, our Brazil plant is now fully operational. It is a state-of-the-art manufacturing facility integrated with SAP. Commercial production and delivery is underway. Several potential customers have evinced keen interest and we are confident of winning new business and expanding our market share in the near future. As far as sustainability, innovations, recognition and wins are concerned, we steadfastly continue to pursue our ambition to be the most sustainable packaging company in the world. Getting assessed as gold by EcoVadis was a major step towards that objective. Our efforts are now being recognized across forums, with EPL winning two prestigious awards at the fourth edition of the India ESG Summit, uh, Summit and Awards 2023 by Transformers. EPL was presented with the ESG Best Performer of the Year, while EPL's global lead on sustainability was recognized as a top 20 ESG champion. We continue to remain signatories to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, the United Nations Global Compact, and the India Plastics Pact, while continuously working towards improvement on external validations and recognitions. With this backdrop, we have launched a company-wide effort towards EcoVadis Platinum. EPL continues efforts on innovations, with the company receiving three awards at the recent RESPAC, which is Responsible Packaging Awards for its innovative and sustainable packaging. Some of our business wins include entry into new categories and Lamitube and Platina conversions. Examples of these have been shown in the investor pack that has been circulated. So, looking ahead, clearly the environment is looking more stable and more predictable, but some challenges remain. Our priorities as we look ahead include continued growth momentum in India and China, though recognize that there is some demand softening in Western geographies. Accelerate beauty and cosmetics by winning small consumers, uh, small customers. Ramp up volume and expand our customer base in Brazil. Continue focus on margin improvement through mix and cost efficiency, efficient capital allocation, and manufacturing location optimization. And finally, drive customer conversion to sustainable solutions. So, in continuation of past quarters, we remain focused on driving growth with continuing margin recovery. Net-net, we are cautiously optimistic about the future to deliver double-digit growth with margin improvement. Thank you. We will now open the call up for questions. Thank you very much, sir. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask questions may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Samir Gupta from India Infoline, please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Thanks. And good evening. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, firstly, just trying to get more color on the overall top line growth performance. What I notice is that uh, there has been a slowdown in the revenue growth trajectory across all geographies except China. China also, the base was very low. So, 11.5% growth good, looks good, but uh, I would believe on a 
low base it's still on the lower side so just wanted to understand this performance geography wise is it just a phasing issue any any major issues that you would want to highlight so i would uh, say that as far as the demand outlook is concerned um our assessment is that um, india remains solid china you're right we are lacking a, a relatively low base um what has happened in china is that there has been some shift away from china for exports by large multinationals but that's already in the base okay uh, exports out of china that we do right beyond that to places like thailand and so on remain robust i would say that given the overall environment in china um i think we are just being watchful of how china plays out okay um we have seen some demand softness um um in us but particularly in europe okay and we are continuing to see a bit of that softness play out uh, as far as these two geographies are concerned um uh, i think we remain more um uh, what should i say uh, realistic about what's going to happen in the us but probably a little more pessimistic given the overall environment in europe so that's really a round up to so the numbers are the numbers which you've seen but that's really a flavor of how we are seeing it right as far as we are concerned i can tell you that over the last year and a half or so a lot of the management intensity went behind margin improvement and cost reduction we are keeping a tight leash on costs and keeping the belt tight but we are renewing effort to push growth harder particularly behind bnc beauty and cosmetics where you know we have lower global share right and we have a big headroom for improvement so we are doubling up efforts to push uh growth uh, in bnc so that's a broadly um, i would say a sum up of uh, uh, the top line sir got it uh, second question is on the margins europe and americas i mean they they continue to be subpar so are we still getting you know facing issues getting price hikes here are we done with the price hikes and this is the new normal is it just a function of negative leverage any any color here would be helpful so i'm not sure if um, uh, well I, that's your judgment on them being subpar but let me put it this way that both have delivered double digit margin okay i think there's opportunity for margin improvement particularly in the americas there have been some one off to do with health insurance and so on which will not happen again because of which the margins are a little subdued okay but uh, overall i think that um, you know as we drive growth momentum and as growth comes back to europe we have significant opportunities to improve margin um, what i can tell you is that the belts have been tight on cost and by and large we've met whatever opex forecasts we had so it's really a bit of um, a growth leverage right that we need to continue to drive just a follow up sir uh, here uh, the price hikes that were due here in americas and europe are we are we still uh, you know uh, in that process or that is done now and uh, uh, going forward it is about getting more customers here and growth yeah i would say that price hikes in general not just for europe and americas in general now are few and far between okay by and large whatever had to come has come um However I have to say that there are some um particularly with our contracted customers there's a pass through of cost uh, input cost reductions that has started flowing into pricing as well so i think one has to recognize that there will be a tempering of pricing right not so much in terms of positive pricing but there will be some negative pricing as well that is flowing through and some of it has started flowing through particularly for contracted customers already got it sir i'll come back in the queue for any follow up thanks okay thank you thank you the next question is from the line of ritesh kandhi from discovery capital please go ahead 
Hi, sir. So, uh, you know, actually, you know, would you be able to share a uh, data on EBITDA of, uh, you know, let's start now for actually like AG, uh, a by product and by, 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 you know, by, you know, geography to give us an indication on the trajectory of, of the business? I'm sorry, I didn't quite follow the question. Would you mind repeating? Sure. So if you could just share with us the EBITDA per, you know, let's turn uh, by product and by geography, it would be helpful to help us evaluate the trajectory of this business. By product, we don't share. By geography, it is there in the deck. Right? By geography. And we give geography by regions, four regions. That data is in the deck already. And that should be available to you, uh, you know, if you access the investor deck. Okay, okay, okay. Maybe I've never missed it in this one. I have an access. Let me just get back in. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Participants who wishes to ask questions may press star and one. The next question is from the line of Sanjesh Jain from ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for taking my question. Um, sorry, I'm sticking on this revenue growth again. Uh, you said that MSI, you are satisfied, but if you look at the number of 5% growth, YOY, uh, it really doesn't uh, uh, picture the kind of robustness we are seeing. Um, and if you look at for last four quarters, uh, progressively the uh, revenue has only decelerated. Well, last year it was a double-digit growth. Now we are at a single mid, um, uh, mid-single-digit growth. Is it to do more with the uh, price pass-through? Um, if that is the question, then why margins have again uh, fallen sequentially uh, with price pass through our EBITDA per kg or a gross profit per kg is protected, which should have implied that we our margins ideally should have gone up, while MSI, if you see sequentially, margins have also uh, did by 200 basis point and revenue growth has also fallen to 5% YOY growth. How should we reconcile this on the MSI side? <coughs> So I'll request uh, Amit to chip in on the the margin part. See, on the growth part, I just want to say this, that um, (coughs) so there is some tempering of the revenue growth numbers because we've had a specific short-term challenge in Egypt, right? There is a translation loss of the Egyptian pound, which I mentioned earlier, right? And the reality is that now... Fresh pricing is few and far between. Okay. So when you combine all of that, right, the optics of revenue growth are going to be a little softer, right, in the immediate term. Right? And that's what is there. Now, this does not mean, by the way, that we are not doing lots of things to push growth harder. Right? And I said that uh, in response to the earlier question. We are absolutely doing stuff to push growth harder, but that is a a reflection also of the softening input costs, right? And therefore, what is happening to the optical revenue numbers? Now, as far as the margin is concerned, the margin, uh, Sanjay, margin for uh, you can't see it on sequential basis because there are seasonality also in this business. And if you see uh, for the last quarter, the revenue was also higher. Uh, if we see the June numbers, correct? So that will depend on the product. No, this was, so this was only two crore more, Amit. It was only two crore more in the MSR. Yeah. We were at 338 crore. We are at 336 crore. I don't see too much of a difference in revenue there. That's right. But there are there are seasonality and there are product mix also, correct? Because from the seasonal, your product mix also changes between beauty, pharma, and oral. Okay, okay. Uh, continuing on this uh, revenue growth again, Amit, uh, uh, I thought we have a dollar billing. Um, so how should the currency depreciation uh, or a devaluation really hit us on the revenue? You are telling that and itself has collapsed there and uh, uh, that's the reason. And how much is Egypt uh, hitting, uh, if, you, if you can also number? Assuming Egypt was normalized, what would have been a revenue growth? So, see, in each country there are 
some of the export sales also which is dollar billing also but the local sales are in the local currencies correct so that is one but if you see india is stand alone uh, and the numbers are there in the public india stand alone growth is almost around 7% 6.9% okay but again 6.9% is really not that encouraging we were talking of a double digit growth right to sustain um and in that context is that a slow down are we losing market share uh, what is really uh, how should one see this so i just want to say that um, so our medium to long term ambition absolutely is double digit right now we are going through cycles of commodity of acceleration and inflation and softening of commodities right and obviously that affects pricing and and revenue okay so i just want to say categorically that as far as india is concerned we have actually built market share right there is absolutely no question of market share loss now the revenue number is a combination obviously of margin of mix and of pricing right and it's a combination of that so i think we are just going through these cycles when you know you had hyperinflation of input now you are having softening to an extent and part of that is playing out in the uh, revenue numbers right so are we alarmed about performance in india no right there is absolutely nothing Uh, that is to do with market share loss or any challenge other than the fact that the numbers is a combination of these three factors right and i think these things will normalize themselves um, as we look ahead fair enough uh, my next question is on america uh, in america if you go back to fy20 um, we had a quarterly revenue of close to 150 170 crore and uh, we used to do an ebitda margin of uh, 20 plus percent uh, the revenue has scaled up to a uh, uh, about 200 crores kind of a run rate while margins have fallen to 11% kind of a thing um, how should we see the margins in america again going back to 20% is it really possible or you think uh, the new um, normal level of margins in america will be uh significantly lower than the historical trend so you know america is a combination of a mix of the countries as well right uh, which is uh, mexico and colombia i mean if i were to just so there has been some margin erosion particularly in the us during this period okay during this period of hyper input cost inflation there has been some uh, loss of margin we have a very clear plan for margin recovery i'm not going to say whether it's 20% or some other number right but we have a very very clear plan for margin recovery which includes um, growing the business as well as some structural cost changes right and we are absolutely working on that so that's the best visibility i think i can give you as far as the us is concerned right there has been no big margin erosion right and i'm not looking at one quarter alone no big margin erosion in the other smaller countries right there has been something in the us and there is a clear plan to recover that got it uh, last question from my side on the brazil uh, can you give more color on the financial uh, uh, in terms of what is the revenue run rate annualized for say exit month um, what kind of utilization level have we reached and um are you achieving the profitability what we anticipated at the time of starting the project that will be helpful it's too early to give you any steady state kind of um uh, indication as far as brazil is concerned um i will say that there was a slight delay in the the volume ramping up okay and that is absolutely normal in the project of this kind when customers are also down stocking volumes etc etc right i think we have started reaching the kind of ramp up that we would like in july okay okay so that we have seen the step up happen q1 was relatively soft on volume uh, but a lot of 
trial was happening, some commercial sales started happening, but July I think the ramp up has started. We are nowhere near the ramp up numbers that we want and it will still ramp up from July onwards, but July we've had a sizable uh, uh, volume as far as Brazil is concerned. I think we'll have to wait at least for another quarter for us to give you a better guidance on um, where the stable volumes are, what will you contribute, and how the profitability will look for the project, right? But by and large, apart from a month here or there, for most factors, I would say we are broadly on track. Just one follow-up. Um, are we still in active discussion with the potential client, and how is that pipeline looking in Brazil? So we are in active conversation with several customers and I think we are very close to having got order from one new customer, right, uh, as we speak. So the journey of expanding the customer base has started, albeit with one customer right now, but the teams on the ground are at it. We have ourselves connected with many global MNCs who are present on the ground in Brazil. And all I can say is that there's huge interest, and I think you will see momentum building in terms of widening the customer base. Got it. Uh, thank you, thank you, Anand, thank you, Amit, for uh, providing elaborate answers, and uh, uh, thanks, and the support for the coming quarters. Thank you very much. Thank you. Participants who wishes to ask questions may press star and one on the touchstone form. We'll take the next question from the line of Sumant Kumar from Mutilal Oswal. Please go ahead. So, can you talk about, you were talking about uh, health insurance cost in America. So, X of health insurance, what is the EBIT, term, EBIT margin for America? So, uh, I can't share the number specifically, Sumanda, but this is kind of a timing difference only, which will over a period of time during the course of years will nullify. So, net net, if, if, if uh, we'll incorporate health insurance cost, so there is no margin decline. No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that there is a one-off in this quarter because of the health insurance. And I'm saying that it is just a timing difference. Over a period of time in this year, this cost will nullify over a period of time. So. <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, tax side, uh, we have a lower tax this quarter. So what is the effective tax rate for FY24? FY24, you can take effective tax rate as a normal around, say, 26-27%. Okay. So so the you are talking about the Q, uh, in three quarters, the tax rate will be higher? Tax rate, on and it will also depend on certain uh, dividends which comes okay. on the subsidiary, which we have seen uh, last two, three quarters. So there will be some benefit also. Uh, maybe just wait for one more quarter and then we will have visibility on those uh, those things also. Okay, so we can maintain the previous guidance what you have given in the Q4? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. A reminder to all the participants, if you wish to ask a question, you may press star in one. We'll take the next question from the line of Ritesh Gandhi from Discovery Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. You know, I just did a relook through this presentation. I am not able to locate the EBITDA per unit ton uh, anywhere, actually. If you could point me out uh, on uh, where it is. Ritesh, normally we do not share EBITDA per ton or per thousand or, or uh, product-wise. Uh, our uh, uh, normal reporting is the segment results, and you will see reason why is a beta on slide number uh, 20. No, I see that. I see that. Yeah. How about see, sir, in in actually a business where our revenue increases when the raw material prices increase, which leads to the then the lower EBITDA margin. In an environment where obviously the raw material reduces, our revenue may go down, and our EBITDA percentage may go up. So all through our introductory actually comment, we are talking about EBITDA percentage increasing, but that in actuality is irrelevant from an investor angle, right, sir? Because unless we know what is the volume growth which is happening, what is the historical EBITDA per ton, where are we now, how are we able to make a, like, a decision on how to look at the business? 
Because the actual percentage is totally irrelevant, right? So forget the percentage. I, in my opening comments, I talked of absolute EBITDA growth. So, so I get that, but I think that, that might yeah. also be, but I think that would also be a factor of actually increased, like, uh, actually, uh, actually, like, capacity uh, utilization can also lead to higher absolute EBITDA, right? So how do we get a breakup to know how much of our absolute EBITDA growth is driven by actual increase in volume versus by increase in pricing so we can get a sense on where do the trends are heading in this business? See, we are not giving granularity on pricing separately, right? Our revenue growth is a combination of volume, price and mix, right? And I've explained many times before that Strategically, this business is driving growth through BNC overall, right? Therefore, doing mix improvement, and of course, there has been some pricing as well, but there's also volume as well. So, we are not giving that granularity because strategically, we are trying to drive revenue growth through all these three. So, I understand that, sir, but I'm saying for us to evaluate, are we driving the revenue growth at 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 the cost of the margins, or are we not? I mean, I'm sure. I mean, you've got a Blackstone as an investor. You can ask them also. This would be a key data point. Anyone would look at to invest in any business which is like which is actually a convertible business, right? So, Ritesh, I think uh, we no, normally do not share this kind of granular data. And maybe so just, uh, on the number... I'll just leave this as a request. I'll just leave this as a request with you. If you could consider in the future to actually bring in high-quality new public investors, this is a very important data point in, in my view for us to get a real view on what is the quality of the business going ahead and how good it's obviously existing. Uh, uh, the team has been able to yeah, Ritesh, we can take it offline. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks. Thank okay. you. Okay. Participants, if you wish to ask questions, please press star in one. We'll take the next question from the line of Samir Gupta from India Infoline. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Thanks again uh, for taking my question. Now, earlier when we were going through the inflationary period uh, uh, and there were subsequent price increases lined up, we had said that a typical margin equivalent of the previous years will be 18 and a half because of the optical impact on price increases and uh, cost going up. Uh, uh, now, in line with the deflationary time when we are try passing on the uh, 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 decrease in commodity cost, at least where we are contracted, would it be fair to assume that this 18 and a half will probably settle at a higher rate? Maybe will uh, take some from the revenue growth, but margins should settle at a higher number. Uh, would that be a fair assumption? See, we are not going to give you a, a number of our margin ambition. But what I have said in the opening comments is that we are committed to continuous margin improvement, right? And we'll get the margin to what we believe will keep us competitive in the marketplace as well, right? So you cannot keep increasing the margins indefinitely. But please also look at absolute EBITDA growth, okay? Because that's a reflection of real profit that the business is making. And one more comment that I would like to make is, um, on, from a revenue standpoint, you know, this is business with some seasonality. Right? So sequential comparisons, right, we don't really believe reflect the performance of the company. It is YOY. You have to look at the same quarter of the previous year to get a proper assessment of how we are performing. Okay? So I just want to leave that uh, uh, as well, not just for you, but for everyone else in the call. <coughs> Fair enough, sir. That's all from me. Uh, just stay, just will take this moment to thank Amit for for all his time and uh, uh, inputs and welcome Deepak. Thanks. Thanks all. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask questions, you may press star and one on your touchstone phone. We'll take the next question from the line of Udit Gupta, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Uh, sir, my question is regarding the uh, debt level. That, uh, do we see it uh, moving lower 
I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, Mr. Gupta, your voice is breaking. One moment. Question is, uh, is my voice clear right now? Yeah. Yeah. So my question is regarding the debt level, sir. So by the end of the financial year, do we see it moving higher or lower? So what is the trajectory? So the debts are normally, we track our debts based on different ratios. Uh, it's not a question of absolute values where the debts are. Based on the growth, we definitely leverage our balance sheet, but our uh, leverage ratios are very strong, be it DSCR, ISCR, and debt equity. So if there are growth opportunities, yes, uh, the balance sheet can take more leverage, but that's how we monitor our debt. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, the participant has left the queue. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question for today. I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. Pratik Tholia for closing comments. Over to you, Mr. Tholia. Yeah, uh, thanks, Michelle. Uh, on behalf of uh, Swiss Management Institution Equities, I would like to thank all the participants. I would like to also take this opportunity to thank uh, Mr. Amit Jain, our outgoing CFO, for his uh, support over the last many years. Uh, to all the to all, all of us uh, and this as well as investors, and I'd like to also welcome our incoming CFO, Mr. Deepak Goyal. Uh, once again, thanks to the management for giving us the opportunity to host this conference call. Uh, Mr. Kapalu, would you like to make any closing comments? No, I just want to thank everyone who attended this call uh, for the interest that you've shown, and um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Bye bye. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Systematics Institutional Equities, that concludes this conference. We thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines. Thank you.